Hello there, welcome to the Business Day Sustainable Philanthropy Series brought to you by Business Day in partnership with the Ford Foundation. On this show, we get to speak with individuals and organizations making impact and touching lives one day at a time. Today, I'm seated with Florence Otedola, popularly known as DJ Copy, who will be speaking to us all about our foundation today on the series. Welcome to the show, Copy. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm so excited to be talking about the other side of my brand, which is philanthropy, away from music, but so much more impactful. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So let's just go straight into it. What inspired you to start this foundation and focused on eradication of poverty and education? What inspired you to start? Well, it's really interesting. Obviously, I was born in Nigeria and I was always very creative. I think Lagos is one of the most dynamic cities, but it's also a city full of so much hardship where I'm so aware of my privilege and access to education. You know, behind the decks, I wouldn't be the woman I was if not for my education. I was educated in Lagos up until 16 years old. And then I came to the UK where I was able to complete my A-levels and then go on to further education. I have a degree from King's College, New York University and Oxford University. And again, for me, it's not the scholarly aspect that education brings. It's the disciplinary and the network and the confidence it puts in Africa and young people. So I am very passionate about making sure that people have access to education. So the Copy Foundation was founded really around this idea of me wanting to help others. You know, they say unto whom much is given, much is expected. And oh. so I always felt like my servicing was beyond just music to the world, but also kind of trying to reduce that gap. And education in particular is important to me because I believe that, like you mentioned, it, the eradication of poverty really comes from education. And so I'm passionate about my foundation, making sure that we partner with different organizations that provide educational resources and tools. We also do humanitarian work, which is important because you cannot give a sick child a book to read, but it's really important as well to break some of these cycles. And I really believe that what is the next step for developing nations like Nigeria is mass education. And that will really get us out of our cycle into developing ourselves on another level. I think education is really power. Knowledge is power. And it's really helped me. I'm the best example of why should you go to school? It might waste your time. You know, people say in my music industry, I don't really use school. And that's true. I might not use my math calculations. I might not use my chemistry formulas. But again, it's the discipline and the confidence to absorb information and also use it. That's what education does, not to mention the network it provides and also dealing with problem solving. You know, whether you're going to be an entrepreneur or, or you're going to work for a company, we're all going to at some point enter the work field and you need education as that backbone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how long have you been running this organization and just how many people have benefited so far? Well, I started the Copy Foundation, I believe, in 2017. Um, and it's something that has organically grown. You know, I started off kind of just being a personal donor to a group of young people who I partnered up with, Nikki Laoye, who is a great philanthropist in the Nigerian space, and she helps people with disabilities. And I think it grew, and we became a partner of Save the Children about five years ago where we did a gold gala and we broke the fundraising record for Save the Children. And that's basically our main partner. So we have programs around the country, including Katsina, but mainly in Bono State. I'm very proud. We fund a stabilization center in the degree, which I personally visited. And what's behind what we do is really making sure particularly Nigerians are able to have the cushioning they need because Nigeria is already hard as it is, and I know that from being a Nigerian, but I'm also aware of my positionality. And without the cushioning I have, I wouldn't be able to follow my dreams. You know, we tell so many young people and children, you can be what you want to be. But in Nigeria, you cannot be what you want to be if you don't have the right access or resources. So that's what we do. And as far as our impact, we, we provide resources for over 70,000 children a day. 
through our programming wow. for the children. And also with our other partnerships, including Princess Trust, including our work we do in Uganda, we provide funds for people in sports. And also more recently, we have the Copy Fund across my alma maters, particularly Oxford University, where we provide hardship funding for students of African descent. So for me, it's a two-way thing. It's not just people from Nigeria, but people from Nigeria that also come abroad and need that extra support. Mm -hmm. And can you share with us a success story that particularly resonates with you? I mean, I know you do all of this amazing work, but you probably have one that particularly oh. resonates with you, or so okay. many. Well, I'm going to highlight two. I'll highlight two of recent. Well, actually, I'll highlight, yeah, I'll highlight two. So we'll do one in Nigeria and one abroad. So the one in Nigeria is a girl called Maryam who came to the Stabilization Center in, in, in Bono State. And Maryam was the daughter of essentially a child mother, a very underage girl that had her from a young age. And Maryam was a girl that wanted to go to school but was unable to be consistent with school because of access to education, access to clean water, transportation, you know, I think we forget Nigeria has 36 states and, you know, it's very easy as a philanthropist to focus on Lagos. Mm -hmm. But I'm very proud that I went outside my comfort zone and did most of my programming up north because as a philanthropist, the difference between philanthropy and charity is the needs. Charity, you just give. Philanthropy, you listen and you actually feed back. So Bono needed more help than Lagos. So with Miriam, we were able to get her resource, able to get her mother treatment at the center, get them. They were actually malnourished. People don't realize the effect that pneumonia and malnourishment has on Nigerians up north. We were able to feed them every day. And also with Miriam, we've broken a cycle where because of her education and she's in school, she's not going to be a child bride. She's now going towards developing her own life and breaking that cycle and also being able to take care of her siblings. So that's a great story. And then we have another story, which is from going to Oxford University. I was very public about going back to school at 30 years old. I did a master's. I wrote a thesis in Oxford about how long I'll, I think it'll take for Nigeria to have a female president. And during that time, there were you know 27 of us, but only 26 of us graduated because there was a young man who I'll keep anonymous for confidentiality to protect him, but he was unable to finish and graduate just because of rent. So imagine you've gotten into Oxford, you have the visa, you have the scholarship, but because of rent, you cannot finish your studies. That broke my heart. And, you know, I have to say he was much more academically advanced than me. The university had done what they could because they were, had already given him a scholarship. So my thing with my copy fund that I planted in Oxford and we're planting in New York University and King's College, all the schools I've gone to, it's about getting African students into these amazing establishments, but also keeping them there. You know, there's getting in, but staying there. You know, he didn't have a winter coat. All of us went back home for Christmas. He couldn't travel because of the airfare. So that fund is really to support students and make sure that they have what they need to finish. Sometimes it's just some food. Sometimes it's rent. Sometimes it's winter coats. Sometimes it's just being able to fly back home during the holidays to see your family. So we make sure, again, we provide cushioning for people. I mean, this is so such beautiful work that you're doing, Copy. And I imagine that you'll definitely be facing some challenges as well as you go about it. So do you want to list to us some of the challenges you get to face uh, in your efforts to tackle poverty and tap, um, provide education for young people? Yeah, I think first of all, you know, you have a good point that challenges, philanthropy comes with challenges, you know, and again, philanthropy if done right is about impact. And there is no such thing as 100% impact. There's always going to be more people you want to help. There's always going to be bureaucracy failure and I've gotten it wrong sometimes. I remember one of my first programs to Borno State. I went there with school books and I was so embarrassed because when I got to the center, 
these children, some of them couldn't even, they were on life support machines. They couldn't even breathe. They couldn't like function. So the last thing I can do is give them a book. So that's when I realized, actually, I'm not in the charity. I'm not in the business of giving. I'm in the business of changing. And so that's a challenge I often face where you, I, I get tempted to do quantity, but it's really quality. So one challenge I face is, you know, the big number of 70,000 are people that we keep alive and we keep fed. But the number of people we break out of that cycle, which is the sustainable part of philanthropy, is probably a lot less. And it's hard because people are in patterns. People are used to things. You know, I've entered certain environments where the parents don't want the children to go to school. You know, they want them to go to work or even for their own cultural reasons, they want their daughters to get married early. So I have to be aware of the environment. And I also struggle with being pressure to deliver on numbers over impact. Because I can say 70,000, but I can't tell you I've changed those lives. I'm just keeping those lives going. So that's something I struggle with. But like the stories of Miriam, you know, the stories of even, you know, that classmate of mine in Oxford, those are the real changes. And also, you know, there's, for example, through the Princess Trust, a new organization that I've been working with, I mean, it's run by His Royal Highness King Charles. I now mentor someone. Now, I've been in Nigeria many times and I get asked to be people's mentor, but mentorship is so much more than just having someone that you meet and you take pictures with and you give advice to. Mentorship is seeing them through and through. So through Princess Trust, I have a mentee called DJ Pebs. She's someone that I have seen, I've spoken to frequently. She's come to my house. I'm one message away from her and I'm very proud because that's someone whose life I had changed. So that's another example. So I'm at a point where with my stage in life and with what I'm really trying to do on the area, and I know the theme of this whole collection is really looking at how they can be sustainable. The idea of sustainable advocacy, the idea of sustainable philanthropy unfortunately might not be a large number, but it's really changing those lives because DJ Pebs that I mentor is going to mentor someone else. Of course. And that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting, everything that you've said. I mean, I'm thinking of how you would talk about measuring the impact of what your foundation is doing because you're doing all of these things. And I like how you are particular about quality over quantity, despite the pressure of everything that you have to face in trying to make sure that many people get value and you're yes. touching lives, which is very important. So how do you get to measure the impact that your foundation makes with all of these initiatives that you carry out? Well, I think it, it's the impact kind of, the way of measuring it is, you know, through our partnerships. And that's why we have different partnerships. So, you know, like we have Save the Children, who's our humanitarian partner. You know, they're the ones that really deal with kind of keeping people alive, primary health care, life support machines, nutrition, you know, births and all those very, very, there's a particular doctor in Bono I work with, Dr. Nura. I've sat down with him. I visited the site, you know. So that is a very, very transactional thing where we know every day how many people come in and how many people come out. Now, what's interesting and another challenge we face is the number of people that return is also high. And that shows that it's a bit of a cycle where, you know, people are just kind of coming for resources. They're not changing the patterns, but that's a direct, just numeral um, factor. But as far as kind of other impacts, I would say are non-tangible. Sometimes it's not about the numbers. Sometimes for me, you know, just for one second, stepping into my music career, you know, I consider what I've done as an impact, seeing more female DJs alone, seeing more people chasing their dreams. That for me is impact. And, you know, I cannot directly quantify how many people have been, been inspired by what I've done. But certainly gender equality has been lessening. Inequality has been lessening in Nigeria. Um, I mean, you know, you're a female and, you know, 
you can look at journalism and the work in this sector and charity, you see more women. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also the idea of, I don't know, it's hard to measure, but it's really of positionality. So, you know, the conversations and forums and boards I'm joining, um, I think are testament to some of the work we do. Last year, I spoke at the United Nations General Assembly, um, which was fantastic. And I actually spoke about Miriam herself. And I think also just being able to work with people and sit on tables with people that, and they want to hear from me, but they also want to hear from Nigerians. So I think people that want to help Africa, listening to Africans is important. And I think that's a thing to measure with. That's certainly a metric. And I think also for me as an African that gives to Africans, the amount of Africans that engage in philanthropy for them, their own people has increased. You know, mm -hmm. we don't want that white savior aesthetic. We don't need help from everybody. We can actually help ourselves. And I think that's also a testament and the things that people are doing. And it's not just across Nigeria, it's across the continent. There's amazing programs. Um, and I'm, I work with different organizations. We've been engaging with countries like Zimbabwe. We've been engaging with countries like South Africa and even Uganda. And it's amazing the amount of Africans that are becoming self-sufficient and giving back themselves, not waiting for other people to do it for them. With you already talking about all of these countries that you've been engaging with, it brings me to the next question I was going to ask you. I was going to ask about how you get to collaborate with other governments and other NGOs to maximize your impact. How do you reach out to these people? or How do they reach out to you? What exactly is the process like? Well, I mean, I guess that's a good question to, for you to answer because, you know, how did PwC for Foundation and Business Day reach out? You know, I think there's a lot of value, I think, in having social media, but also using it. You know, I no longer just use my platform to display my music. I use it to display causes I'm passionate about. And, you know, people ask me, what's my thing? My thing is um, SDG for Sustainable uh, Goal Development for Education. And there's a reason it's for, you know, we know poverty is high up there. But the reason it's for is because... It's so important, knowledge is power, information is power. So me, not only using my platform and my millions of followers to listen to my music, me using it to talk about how I feel about education and also me being a student myself, you know, my fan base in lifetime, basically they all deserve certificates because they went through my degree with me. And I think that authentic thing I'm having a hard time writing my thesis. This is the process I have to go through for research. Being very, very open and transparent has really helped me as well. And so I think a lot of people see that and they reach out. And, you know, I think that, that this is the difference between charity and philanthropy. Philanthropy is about partnerships and it's about synergies and charity is just giving. So I think that I end up building a lot of relationships and a lot of synergies through work online. And also, I think I'm joining this group of international philanthropists, you know, where like the, my opportunity at the UN came about from someone else knowing about me and, and loving the story of my philanthropic work. So, you know, it's really important, I think, that people, as much as they make noise about, you know, their entrepreneurial successes or they're artistic or creative, they should make noise as well about causes that are close to their hearts. I have to give it to you, Copy. when it comes to authenticity, you are number one in that. Everyone knows, everyone sees everything that you're doing and it's very admirable. So kudos to you. On the good days and on the bad days. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no one that does it like you. And this is not because I'm speaking to you. You just show it as it is. You're Thank a very you. genuine person, yes. And I also like that you've also helped us to understand the difference between charity and philanthropy because many times I even make that mistake. I say, oh, charity organization, I'm thinking it's the same thing, but you have done well to you know, just show us the differences between both. So I was going to ask you what other innovative approaches your organization uses to carry out some of the projects that you do. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think, again, back to your point, just um, notes, you know, charity and philanthropy, philanthropy being more engagement, more partnership, but we also need charity because without charity, we won't have the money, we won't have the resources. So, you know, the philanthropic sector need charitable people, they need charity work. You need people that are just willing to give and take a step back. In the ecosystem, you have different stakeholders. So I'll answer your question. You have actual organizations that program and carry out operations. You have people like me who are philanthropists and are intermediate read, but also play a role in operations and direction and fundraising. Then you just have the donors who are solely fundraisers and givers. So philanthropy is just as important as charity as they are all the organizations. So they all kind of make the whole space. Now, one of the innovative ways in which I've been able to, I think, carry out the work we do is in that framework. There's not a single program that we execute. We're always intermediaries. So we're like the vessels. So, you know, we'll have partnerships. For example, a great example is our partnership with Oxford University. It is funded by Templars Law Firm. And our partner is an organization in Oxford called AFOX, the Africa Oxford Initiative. And you've got Copy Foundation in the middle. And so, you know, you have Templar gives us the funds. We're able to partner it, resource it, and give it to AFOX who run the programming. So this is innovative because unfortunately, a lot of people think they can do all the work themselves. You cannot do the work themselves. And I picking each student would not be efficient. I've graduated, I'm not on ground. I'm not able to understand the current challenges. So I think philanthropists need to take a step back and be able to know when to be, you know, when to press in and when to press out, to press and press out. So for example, I'll be very involved when it comes to mapping out and fundraising and being able to deal with the kind of resource part. But I don't pick who the funds go to because the students, the teachers, the professors, they know better who needs it. They also know better what the challenges are. So innovative for me, philanthropy is being able to, to delegate and picking exactly where it should go. I haven't lived in Nigeria for a number of years. I'm not well in bus. I can get the resources, I can fundraise, but I need local engagement. I need some, exactly. So I think that's innovative and that's something we need to understand. There's a lot of case studies about, you know, a lot of programmings that have failed or not been, not even impactful, not been effective where money has been wasted because there was no localized partner, or perhaps they decided to do the, they had all the funding, but they didn't have the right people to execute it. And you always need a local partner. And sometimes it means working with another organization that can execute better because they are there. Mm -hmm. So, and what advice would you give to other uh, people who are interested in starting initiatives such as this? What I will say is, first of all, it, it is very difficult to run a foundation. And I almost feel like, you know, we also have to look at the reason behind it. But before you look at your what you want to do, you need to look at why. I entered the space by mistake because I was giving and I needed infrastructure. You know, it came to the point where I couldn't just give my own funds and it needed to be managed. But I think you need to look at your why. The reason I've continued and I've built my foundation is because there is a massive, massive opportunity for me to reduce the gap for education. I know this is what I want to do. I myself, having been someone that has access to education and realizes it's a privilege, wants to give that privilege to other people. So that is my why. So I would say that my advice is always know your why. What is it you're passionate about? Is it climate? Is it gender inequality? Is it healthcare? What is it? And when you know what it is, ask yourself why, because very often that will allow you to align. And also, you know, probably not the easiest thing to say, but you have to also learn when to say no. There's initiatives that don't uh, align with me that are just as important, but I'm not just 
it doesn't align with me, so it seems inauthentic for me to support or speak about. So know your thing and do it well. You know, there was that whole, I remember that kind of wave where there were several colleagues of mine in the industry. I don't know whether you saw, it was sort of every Christmas they would go to an orphanage and take pictures. Absolutely, I noticed that. I'm glad that's reduced, but you know, again, that's an example of perhaps ineffective and they didn't think about their why. And actually, I think if they looked at it, you know, they were probably better off using their money to start a studio and develop young talent and give them the chance to express. Charity starts at home. So you have to make sure that you are doing something you believe in that you can identify with. And my last piece of advice would be also, you know, you don't always have to have your own organization. There's fantastic causes. At this point in 2024, if there's something you're passionate about, there's probably already an organization that exists that does it. So, you know, we need to get out of the glorified idea of always starting things. Sometimes you have to continue things. So before you start your own charity, see what's out there and see whether you can support them. Hmm. I think there's something I've learned from everything you've said. You really hammered on how important it is to listen as a philanthropist, that you need to listen to know the needs of the people that you want to help and understanding your what, understanding your why, which is very important. So my final question to you will be, what is the future for Corpus Foundation in terms of looking out for people's education and poverty alleviation? Well, the next steps of the Copy Foundation, I think, is really solidifying our current partnerships. You know, it's not always about new things. Sometimes it's just about renewed things. So there's a difference between new and renewed. You know, so I want a fresh perspective. I want to tighten up on our efficiency. So that exists with our fifth year of our partnership with Save the Children. After doing five years up north, I want to bring some of our programming down south. Another thing I'm looking at is our new partnerships, just kind of renewing them. I'm proud to be the first ever international ambassador for Princess Trust. So we'll be doing some work in Nigeria. Also working with, you know, the United Nations, so many different agencies. I've worked already with the UNDP Nigeria and making sure that also, I think as someone that lives in the UK, I want to make sure I inspire and make the diaspora feel more at home. So I currently support the Africa Center in the UK because you know what, 54 flavors in our continent and being African is now a superpower. So I wanna make sure that anyone that is curious about coming home, and we need people home, we need workforce home, we need doctors, we need lawyers, we need as many people as we can to come back home. I mean, I say it even though I haven't been home, but I, I will come back home. But I think what's next for me is really just making sure that everything I have is watertight and more impactful. I don't need to add more numbers to my list, but I need to add more changed lives to my list. I almost want my list to be smaller. I want there to be less people that need humanitarian and more development. And what happens is I also want those that I've helped, I want them to help others. It becomes this kind of domino effect. So that's what's next for me. And Always, everyone knows I love school. I graduated from Oxford last year. Um, I haven't quite spoken about it, but I think I'm going for my fourth degree. Wow. And so we're <laughs> back for that. Wow. Interesting, Copy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for just sharing with us Business Day. Thank you for showing us, showing us rather, that it's possible to be to come from a privileged background, so to speak, and still be very grounded and just be this person who is leading by example. So keep up the amazing work that you're Thank doing you with Copy so Foundation. Much. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your time, Copy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for joining us on the Business Day Sustainable Philanthropy Series. My name is Elizabeth Musa. Keep watching Business Day.